Amen. You may be seated. Today's reading comes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I encourage you to listen with fresh ears. Even though this text might be familiar to many of you, listen with fresh ears and a new and an open mind and heart for the Word of God. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy and on entering the house they saw the child with Mary his mother and they knelt down and paid him homage then opening their treasure chests they offered him gifts of gold frankincense and myrrh and having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod they left for their own country by another road the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I'm going to grab this here real quick. Well, good morning, friends. My name is Sandra Smith, in case we haven't met yet. And I'm filling in a little bit for Pastor Jeff while he is out in compassionate leave. Um, it has been my privilege and pleasure to be here, and I want to tell you something. I worked hard on this sermon. I spent like eight hours at my little computer, and this morning God said, you didn't think you were going to say that, did you? So everything has changed, anything can happen, just brace yourself. <laughs> Because when these things happen and God speaks, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. <sighs> Welcome to the first Sunday in Epiphany. Which means what exactly? Anybody know? Anybody? Nope, nobody knows. I don't blame you. Epiphany, the word epiphany means a sudden insight or realization. It's kind of like, a, oh, aha, or... Oh, now I get it. Now I get it. And in the church here, Epiphany is all about Jesus. And specifically about what the wise men have to tell us about Jesus. Now, we know these stories about the Magi, as they're often called. Um, and some of them may even be sort of true. For instance, how many wise men were there? Undetermined. We, we say there are three. Look, up three right here. Because they had how many gifts? Three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we have these lovely gifts here that my husband brought it out this morning for me. Um, we have the gold, frankincense, and myrrh right here. And this represents the first and last male-sponsored baby shower. 
<laughs> because I'm sure Mary went, oh, thank you. Thank you. Where, where are the diapers? Where is the pacifier? Um, but we always think there are three, but there could be 20 or two or 116 for all we know. We just don't have any real idea. We always include them in our manger scene with the shepherds, but really it's the timing is kind of tricky because when did the star appear in the sky? And it took them a while to get there. They were probably from Saudi Arabia or Yemen or Iraq or Iran, somewhere in that area. That's not just across the street. So if they saw the star when Jesus was born, he could have been cutting his teeth when they finally showed up in Bethlehem. So we don't know that either. And the trip was not, uh, not comfortable. But one thing we do know is that the, fi the, uh, the wise men were from deep east Texas. <laughs> because the Bible says they came from afar. I'm sorry, it's God. God has taken over. <laughs> so here these guys were, and they're astrologers. They're sorcerers. They're, they're magicians, and they, they're not, their job is to watch the sky every night. And uh, the, what's the meaning of that shooting star? Oh, it must the Texans are going, oh, no, wait. Or oh, that constellation seems to have shifted. What does that mean for our crops? And have a bumper crop of plums coming up or what's happening so they watch the stars and they believe the stars determined human destiny and so God spoke to them in the way that they could hear God put a star in the heavens for them to watch and to follow and it was so beautiful they every I can just imagine every night when the Sun began to go down they get in the second story window or the top of the house they'd look out is it going to show up again tonight? We're, we're, and they saw it begin to move. And night by night it was farther away and they were so loved it and were so attracted to its beauty and its power that they, they said, you know, we've got to fo we follow. We've got to follow. And so, you know, road trip. They packed up their stuff and we don't know if they had camels or horses or chariots, but they couldn't have been comfortable. There were no holiday inns. You know, 7-Elevens, no McDonald's along the way, no Bucky's. You know, so what did they do? They, they kept, follow, kept following and kept following, never gave up. Never gave up. And they finally got to Jerusalem, and they did what kings always do. They followed protocol. There was political protocol in those days, too. And they went to see King Herod and said, okay, we're here, and here's why. And Herod said, oh, really? A baby king? We'll have to see about that. And he made them promise that they would come back and tell him after they found where the baby was lying. And, of course, was Herod going to go worship the baby? No. He had, he had evil motives in his mind and his heart. Magi went to Bethlehem. They walked in the stable. And they were overwhelmed with joy. I mean, think about this. Astrologers, wealthy people, respected folks, fell on their knees in front of this peasant baby and worshipped him and offered him whatever they had to give, the most precious things they had to give. And see how God used the star? God used what they already knew and loved and, and paid attention to to call them to himself. Because what was it all about? It was all about having a relationship with God. And look, look who God called to the manger. First, the shepherds. Shepherds were not necessarily the, the sweet little people we see on Christmas cards. You know, the reason they're out watching their flocks by night was that other shepherds didn't steal their sheep. They had a bad reputation. They were rough and, and they lived rough and they were peasant folk. And yet God called these kind of ne'er-do-wells, hired hands even, they come to the stable, the, the, lower, the lower class, the poor people. And then God called these kings, these, these pagans. These guys didn't have any idea that there was a Messiah coming. They had no clue about that. There was no prophet in their background. And yet God called them, the unholy, the pagan, heathen folk who worship false gods, and called them to himself by using this beautiful star. 
Now, I want to shift gears for a moment. I want to tell you my favorite story of all time. There are only two kinds of people in the world. There are people who love cats <laughs> and people who don't love cats. And our friend Bill was the former. He was not a fan of cats. You know that saying, dogs have owners, cats have staff. <laughs> yeah, that's where Bill was. Like, yeah, why would anybody have a cat? But he did like his little next door neighbor. And when she came over one day just sobbing, he had to open the door and help her. And he said, honey, what's wrong? And she said, my kitty cat got out of the yard and he's in your backyard. He climbed up in a tree and he won't come down. And Bill said, well, let's see if we can get him thinking to himself, stupid cat. Went out there, and sure enough, there was this tall, slender tree planted a couple years ago, and the cat was at the very top, kind of swaying back and forth, meow, meow. And Bill, oh, great. So he's here, kitty, here, kitty, nothing, you know. He went and got his wife, and she came out, and here, kitty, here, kitty, nothing. Went and got a can of tuna fish, here, kitty. Nothing. And Bill said to his wife, you know, honey, I think if I just grab hold of this trunk of this tree, it's so slender, I think I could pull it down and the tip of the tree would kind of bend down like this and you could grab the cat when it gets close to the, close to the ground. And she said, okay, that's, that's a good idea. So he starts to pull, grabs the trunk of the tree and he's pulling down and the tip of the tree begins to slowly, you know, move towards the ground and Little girl is calling, here kitty, here kitty. And his wife is like, come on, come on. He didn't mean to do it. <laughs> he didn't intend to do it, but somehow he lost his grip. And the tree flipped back up. And the cat went sailing through the air, never to be seen again. So, you know, Bill comforted the little girl and promised to buy her a puppy. <laughs> and incident closed. Well, the very next day, Bill happened to be in the supermarket, probably H-E-B. And he bumped into his backdoor neighbor, Doris, and he said, they got to talking about whatever, weather and whatever. And um, he couldn't help but notice that in her basket, in her grocery cart, she had some cans of cat food and a little collar with a bell on it and a cat and a mouse. He said, Doris, when did, when did you and Jim get a cat? He said, well, it's the strangest thing happened. <laughs> Just last night, we were out in the backyard and this cat <laughs> came to the air and, and landed right at our feet. And Jim said, why well, look, Doris, the Lord sent us a cat. <laughs> so here's what I want you to know. For somebody, you're the cat. And God is not sending you out from here today to go eat lunch and have a good, have a good day. God is deploying you. God is sending you out because somebody that you know needs a new relationship with Jesus Christ and needs to know how joyful it is to fall on your knees in front of the Lord and live the kind of life that he has laid out for you. And there are folks who are struggling, who feel hopeless, who feel unloved. I want to tell you about a little church I, I supervise in East Texas. They had about 35 in worship on a Sunday morning, had the same number for years. And the preacher thought, I've got to do something. And he had some signs made that said, God is not mad at you. And the name of the church. They put those signs out around town, little tiny town. That church grew from 35 to 300 people in worship. Because people found out God is not mad at them. People believe that. People think that God wants to punish them eternally. To make them suffer. That is not, we know that's not true, don't we? We know what it's like to know the Lord, to have him active in our lives, to have, know that joy and that 
strength and that power that only he can give. You have to be that cat or that star for somebody. Now, how do you do that? It's really easy. Random acts of kindness. Look people in the eye. Smile at them. Comment on their day. Ask them how they're doing. I, I want to give you a challenge. Um, I'd like you to, I challenge you to pick a person you sort of know, but not your best friend or your grandchild. A person, maybe it's a barista at Starbucks or uh, somebody who cuts your yard or somebody who does whatever. You, God will put some person on your heart. And I challenge you to pray for, that, pray for that person every day for 30 days. And whatever acts of kindness you can do for that person, do them. God will put them on your heart. 30 days until the, February the 4th, I think it is. And stand back and watch God at work. Because this is your chance to partner with God. Partner with God in having someone else create a new relationship with Jesus Christ. This is your chance. God is depending on you. And somebody out there, somebody you barely know maybe, needs you to lead them to Christ. How many of you will do that for 30 days? Yeah? Yeah? I can't wait to find out what God's going to do. Let's pray together. Gracious God, you've given us amazing work to do. Help us be faithful to you and reach out to folks in your name. We, I ask you to go ahead of us and open the hearts and minds of those persons who we're going to be praying for. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.